Now, you can't talk about the history of the Z-Board without talking about another company. You can't talk about the Ouya Game Console without talking about another company. And you can't talk about the Pebble Smartwatch, which is also on the show floor, without talking about another company. That, of course, is Kickstarter. Crowdfunding has absolutely revolutionized the way that people can launch products. No longer, if you have a good idea, do you need to go sell your soul to venture capital or uh, beg, borrow, and steal money from your friends and family or get a third or fourth mortgage on your house. You can now go out and target the people who are most important to you, the consumers. Every day, hundreds of creative individuals, musicians, documentary filmmakers, uh, comedians, comic book artists, and yes, gadget lovers too, go on to Kickstarter and with shaky hands launch their product out to the world and see if people out there are as excited about it as they are. And of course, at the forefront of that crowdfunding revolution is Kickstarter, and that is why I'm incredibly excited to introduce to you this morning co-founder of K Kickstarter, Yancy Strickler. Good morning, sir. Break a leg. I'll see you in a bit. Thanks for coming out this morning. My name is Yancy. It's nice to meet you all. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about Kickstarter, some of the things that are happening through it, uh, answer maybe some of the questions you may have about, about how it's going. Um, so Kickstarter uh, is almost four years old. April 28th will be our birthday. Um, and since then, it's grown fairly steadily. Um, if I can get the presentation up on the screen, that would be great. Um, so in the past four years, over three and a half million people have backed a project on Kickstarter, pledging over a half a billion dollars. Um, these are to films, to albums, to books, um, to pieces of technology, to plays, to dance performances, to all creative things. And this money is going to just regular people, people like you and I who are just looking to make something. Um, and you can see of that half a billion dollars that's been pledged, over $400 million of it has been collected. As you probably know, funding on Kickstarter is all or nothing. You either uh, meet your funding goal and get your cash, or no money at all changes hands. So uh, a very significant portion of the money uh, ends, up being, ends up being successful. Um, over 90,000 projects have launched. 44% of them have been successfully funded. Uh, interestingly, the success rate has been very consistent over time. It was the success rate for the first few months of the site, and it's always been the same. So there's some sort of, I don't know, magic pie-like number to that. Um, but it's been very consistent over the past four years. Uh, all of these numbers that I just showed are actually publicly available. We have a, a page on the site, Kickstarter slash help slash stats, that has live statistics for pretty much everything that we track. Uh, anytime we deploy code, this page updates. You can see info on successful projects, unsuccessful projects. You can drill down into categories. Uh, we really think of Kickstarter as being an experiment. You know, it's an idea that we had that we thought maybe would work. Um, and we're still trying to learn from it. So this, this page is our attempt to share the things that we're seeing with everyone else to see what we can, what we can learn together. And if you open up this page and, and pull out your calculator, you can see things like 89% of all the money that's pledged ends up going to successfully funded projects. This is interesting. The success rate of projects overall is 44%, but almost 90% of the money goes to successful projects. So projects either really make their goal or they don't. There's not a lot in between. And this sort of speaks well of the all or nothing format. There's this vetting that's happening. People really think things are awesome or they don't. You can see that if a project reaches 20% of its funding goal, it's eventually funded 82% of the time. And you can see if it reaches 60% of its funding goal, it's almost always successfully funded. So there's lots of stuff to be learned from that page. And you know, if, if you like numbers and data, I encourage you to dig in and, and see what you can turn up. Um, you know, Kickstarter's uh, available everywhere. And, and here in San Francisco has been one of the biggest hubs for it. You can see $52 million has been pledged to projects here in San Francisco, so 10% of all the money that's been pledged. Um, and those projects have encompassed just about everything. And last night, actually, I, I went to have dinner uh, at a restaurant here on the mission called AQ that did a Kickstarter project to open. Um, and it was really, really good. You should go and you should have the chowder. It was ridiculous. Um, but you know, this is a restaurant that was started here in San Francisco. And as I was walking to the restaurant, no lie, some guy with Revo lights on his bikes rides by. And I'm like, this is, this is a Kickstarter culture right here. Um, that's been a lot of what we've been seeing happen over the, past, over the past year, is that these projects have been made through Kickstarter and they're starting to appear in the culture around us. Um, and about a month or two ago, we did a big feature, a, a year in review of things that happened through Kickstarter in 2012. And it was a look back at just things that existed, things that had come to pass 
that had begun on Kickstarter. And there are things like 10% of the films at the Sundance Film Festival raise money on Kickstarter. That was also true this year. Cards Against Humanity, which maybe some of you have played, was created on Kickstarter. And it topped the Amazon charts every time it was available. There was a Kickstarter-funded opera that premiered at the Kennedy Center. Publishers Weekly called Kickstarter the second biggest publisher of graphic novels in the world. There was the Makey Makey. There were journalism projects all over the world. Journalists from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, raising money directly from the public to cover things that the Redditors weren't interested in. Amanda Palmer raised over a million dollars and debuted in the Billboard Top 10. And 63 movies opened in theaters last year that raised money on Kickstarter. It's been over 100 so far. So these things that are starting on this platform, starting with someone just sharing their idea with their community and seeing what people think, they're filtering up, they're, they're passing through the gatekeepers, and they're managed to be recognized as works of art on their own. It happened in an especially big way just a couple of weeks ago. This is a short film called Innocente that raised money on Kickstarter last year, a little over $50,000. And a couple of weeks ago, it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Short. Amazing, amazing. This past week, there's a project from Veronica Mars. You may have seen this one. People are excited, yes. Uh, so this raised, you know, three and a half million dollars in a couple days, and now everyone's debating what it is that that means. Um, but again, this is just the power of people putting ideas in the world, other people having the opportunity to interact with them, and these things are breaking out of just this, of not just this internet space, and they're, they're being all around us. Um, you see it with something like the Oculus Rift. This was a, a really cool project about a year ago, a virtual reality headset that I unfortunately have yet to play with, but everyone seems to think is going to change the world. You know, that showing up on Jimmy Fallon and it, it blowing his mind. So these projects are continuing to just filter out and filter out and filter out. Um, but of course, this is, a, this is a conference about gadgets and technology. And if you look at hardware projects specifically, um, here's what you see. There have been 4,000 hardware projects that have launched on Kickstarter, and 34% of them have been successfully funded, so a little bit less uh, than the overall funding rate. And collectively, uh, they've seen over $109 million pledged and over $91 million successfully funded. And you can see 84% of those funds have been collected. It's so a little bit lower, again, than the overall site average. But lots of things, lots of things have happened through here. It all started with this project. This is a project by two guys named Dan and Tom who started a little design studio called Studio Neat. And they had been uh, 3D printing with, with Shapeways, making this little, this little iPhone tripod stand that they thought would be pretty cool. At the time this project launched, in September of 2010, that was about a year and a half after Kickstarter launched, it was the first Apple-related project ever on Kickstarter. And um, as you can see, it did really well. It raised $130,000 out of nowhere. This is, this is a really, really big story. Uh, right before the Glyph, the largest, the largest design project on Kickstarter had been this, a vending machine for seed bombs. You could throw these this little balls into the ground and they would just plant trees. This was the largest design project before the Glyph. But the Glyph really changed the game and brought product designers into Kickstarter and introduced Kickstarter to the world of product design. And shortly after the Glyph came the TikTok. Uh, this was a project by Scott Wilson, who's formerly at Nike and done a lot of, a lot of big projects before. And he had this idea to turn a, a nano into a wristwatch. And this project went crazy, went crazy. In, in six weeks it raised almost a million dollars turned everyone's head. And even more incredibly, uh, this project launched in October, and he was fully, he had all of, his, all of his TikToks sent out to all backers by Christmas. So in 90 days, he went from launching the project to fulfilling it. This is a guy who'd managed the global supply chain for Nike before, so he, he really knew what he was doing. Um, but this really set a new bar for how Kickstarter would be used in this kind of space. And you saw things like the twine. This came from uh, some MIT students, a really creative thing. You could see their goal was $35,000. They ended up with over half a million dollars. So these things were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and more and more eyeballs were coming to see these things, thanks to places like Engadget. And then a, a little over a year ago, you had Elevation Dock, which was the first project to break a million dollars on Kickstarter. Uh, this is an a, aluminum, aluminum cast dock for an iPhone. Um, it, it raised a million dollars in, in one day in February. Just a couple hours later, another project raised a million dollars. Came the first two to ever do it within a couple hours of, of each other. But that kicked it up another level. And then, of course, there was the Pebble, um, which still stands as the largest Kickstarter project by, by amount pledged. And, you know, this, this has been a, a really interesting project to follow. Um, you know, as a lot of you probably know, at CES a few weeks ago, Eric, the, the creator of Pebble, announced that they would begin shipping in two weeks. He held up the finished watch. 
Um, but they've really been feeling the heat over the past year of people saying, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And many of the headlines I saw talking about this being available use the word finally. But what's amazing is that he has gone from sharing this idea to having it completed and shipped out to his backers within nine months. And he's done that all under the spotlight, all with people watching every one of his moves and all sharing everything he's doing. There's been this radical transparency to how he's made this thing. And it's something that has really kind of been lost. Um, it's, a, it's a really important, important part of, of Kickstarter. And that's something we were thinking about um, back in September when uh, we posted a, a blog post called Kickstarter is Not a Store um, that made a lot of waves. And, and really, this post introduced some specific regulations for design and technology projects on Kickstarter. And the underlying idea of this was, let's have people be really transparent about what they're doing. Let's not make this a place that follows the same rules as traditional advertising and marketing where you just promise the world and get people to buy things. Let's, be this, let's have this be a place where people just share their ideas, share what they're doing, show their work, show their process, because ultimately that's when these things are at their best. So we did things like prohibiting photorealistic renderings. Um, I spent a year talking to product designers, people at IDEO and Frog and Stanford and you know, world-class designers, and a lot of these people would admit to me that they couldn't tell the difference between a rendering and a real photograph of a real object. And that's, that's a problem. That's a problem, especially when you're sharing things with consumers. Um, we also prohibited product simulation, so I couldn't you know, hold up this bottle of water and say this was powering this entire room. Um, we're trying to set an expectation of just be honest. You know, think about truth in advertising laws, things that ask people to just be straight. Because you're talking to a community of peers. You're not here to maximize and to make as much money as possible. You should be here to share an idea and hopefully bring it to life with a community who wants to be a part of it. And so, you know, if I could sum up what Kickstarter is not a story was all about in three words, it's just show your work. Show your work. That's what we were asking. And, um, and so we put that out there, and it, it got a, a mixed response. It got a mixed response, but we felt really proud of it, and we continue to. And we're going to continue to refine some of the ideas behind it. But what we're trying to do is reinforce the best notions and the best parts of what Kickstarter is. Um, and you see that all the time. A project like the Ouya. The Ouya has been awesome to follow. They've had amazing updates all the way, talking about each phase of what they're going through. This stuff is fascinating. The Pebble. You know, the Pebble, here's a video that Pebble posted called Oodles of Glue. How can you not be excited about that? Um, but, you know, by being a backer of the Pebble, you know what it's like to make something in China and what it is to design and manufacture a watch. You understand that Chinese New Year is a really hard time to get something done. There's all these, all these parts of this uh, that suddenly we're exposed to. And this level of transparency, we, we take for granted. We really take for granted. We just assume that this is how things have always been. But before two years ago, it didn't work this way at all at all. Like the idea that you would have some object in your pocket and you would know who it was that designed it, how it was they did it, that you could see each phase of the process, that you had that sense of authorship to it, that you knew that entire story, is a completely new concept that we have taken for granted very, very quickly. And that's such a core, core part of what Kickstarter is about, is that story of where something comes from. You see with the Oculus Rift, Oculus Rift has been amazing, amazing for updates. I'm each phase of this. And they aren't keeping trade secrets in this stuff either. There, I'm sure there's some things that they are, but you know, they talk about here's the biggest challenge and here's how it is that we thought about it. And they're just being totally open, totally open. Here's the deal. And it's, it's so refreshing. And, and as a backer, you know, this is just as much what the project is about for me as it is the headset, whenever it is that I, that I get it. Um, and, and so that part of it, that part is what we're trying to enforce and encourage with Kickstarter is not a store. And the thing that we want backers to think about. Um, you also see it uh, with, there's just other ways to present the whole process of making things. I want to show a, a quick video. Um, this is from a project called The Cosmonaut, which was the second project launched by the, by the Glyph guys. There's sound here. Did you ever wonder how uh, crayons were made? I've often thought about people making crayons. I'll do some more of this later, but I'd like to show you some people making crayons. Let's come along. I have a film of it here.
And then people take those boxes to the stores where other people come to buy them. That's how they buy the crayons. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. The idea that that would be something interesting is amazing, but, but it really is. Just being able to see that, to see where things come from, is really special. Um, so, you know, Kickstarter's not a store, on the one hand, was, you know, setting uh, a different set of expectations and, and setting some new rules. But also, I think Kickstarter's not a store is an awesome thing because it's kind of better than a store. You know, you have a giant riding walk walking robot that you can be a part of creating. A, really interesting minesweeper that someone's put into work in Afghanistan. This is not something you find in a store. A open source Geiger counter for people to use in Japan to detect radiation levels after the Fukuyama disaster. The first civilian spacesuit designed by a cosmonaut. A cocktail dispensing robot. This one is currently funding now. Um, you know, Kickstarter is not a store. It's a place where people are coming together to make things. As a backer, you're not a consumer, you are a participant, you're a collaborator, you're helping to create right alongside the creator, and that's, that's the really special thing about it. Um, so, you know, that, that's the idea I'd really like to leave you with today, so thanks a lot. That was great. Hello, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a seat. All right. That was a beautiful uh, greatest hits of Kickstarter. I, I enjoyed that, especially the, the making of video. I'm a big fan of, uh, of how it's made, and so you know that was right up my alley. Now, we talked about before how Kickstarter has, has really changed the way that people can launch products, but how did you launch Kickstarter? Uh, sure, yeah, the, the original idea for Kickstarter came from um, our CEO and my partner, Perry Chen. It was in 2001, or 2002, somewhere around then. He was living in New Orleans, and he wanted to put on a concert. We didn't have the money to do it. And he thought if, if only he could have asked people ahead of time if they wanted the show to happen, and people would only be charged if everyone agreed, mm -hmm. that that would make sense, that the show could happen because um, people would basically be deciding on, on their own whether they thought it should exist. And so he had that idea you know, over 10 years ago. And then um, it was just like an idea that kept returning to him. And he and I became friends in 2005 and started working on it together. And, uh, met Charles Adler, our, our other partner. Uh, about a year and a half later, and um, from the moment of us working together on an earnest, it was about three or four years before it could launch because none of us are technical. I was a, a rock critic before this. Perry was an artist and a waiter, and Charles is a graphic designer, mm -hmm. so not not the right pedigree to start a web company. It turns <laughs> out, um, and you know, and to fund it, we did what actually every Kickstarter project does, which is that we went to our friends and family and we tried to convince them that this was a good idea and that we were worth believing in. And then you provided a platform for people to really reach a very their friends and family, as it were. That's right. That's right. Do you have any idea what it would become as big as it has become? Uh, I mean, we, you know, we kept this dream alive for a long time. I mean, it was the years before it launched were not easy. You know, there's this thing that you keep telling your friends about that I think they got really sick of hearing about. Because, um, you know, when is that ever really going to happen? But yeah, I mean, we always believed in this because, you know, we're, we're creative people and um, certainly the kind of art and, and things that we like we know are hard to get made because it's, they're not necessarily hits, they're not blockbusters, they're not things that people are making because they want to make money, they're things that people want to make because they feel inspired and they want something to exist. And so we always knew that that, like that's just a basic human thing that, that people want. People want to create and they need, they need a means to do it and, and we thought Kickstarter could be a, a, a thing that could help them. Far. I do want to say that we are going to be accepting questions for Q&A. It's going to be a, a bit of a short one, but uh, if you have any questions, please use the hashtag uh, ExpandSF, and uh, we'll be picking some of our favorites and, uh, and asking them before we wrap things up. Now, you, you take about 5% of, or I guess it is 5% of, of, of funded projects. So that's actually, you know, if you look at things like the, the iTunes App Store and other projects, that's actually quite a bit lower than that. Was that by design? Uh, you know, we picked our fee years before the site launch. We picked 5% because it was low and round. That was it. Um, it ended up working out all right. But yeah, I mean, you know, th certainly the, the, the value and the deal that you get using Kickstarter is phenomenal. I mean, if you compare it to even, I don't know, getting a grant or a bank loan or in, any other source of funding, um, you know, you're not giving up any ownership or control of your idea. You only lose, you know, you're only asked to pay 5% of, uh, of your fee, uh, of what you raise to us as a fee, and there's additional credit card processing fees that go to the credit card companies. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was a guess that ended up working out. And now in terms of your, 
involvement with those projects as they go through. You're pretty hands off when it comes to the actual development, and I suppose that you would have to be given both of the volume of products that go through and you know the legal intricacies, I guess, that, that come along with that. Yeah. Also, you know, I don't know how to make a movie. You know, like the 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 the. The wide range of things that are made through Kickstarter, you know, exceed our expertise by far. Um, in a general, we just want to be a platform that's there, uh, that's just sort of a place of opportunity for people who want to use it. Um, and from the whole process, we're fairly hands off. I mean, we provide customer service, and we're there to help and give advice if people need it. Um, but for the most part, we really think of it as being a platform where people are sharing their ideas in the way that they see fit. Um, and ultimately, you know, there, there's a mass vetting that's happening of every project. You know, since a project is only, only receives any funds if it's fully funded, um, the crowd is really deciding what has value and what does not. And so, you know, 44% of projects are successfully funded, which means that 56% of projects are not. So for one reason or another, people are deciding that is not something to fund. Um, and so we really view that as being the most effective way to determine, you know, what has value and what doesn't. But there is some risk involved, though, for the backers that, that you know, there is no guarantee that, that they will get their funds. Now, you do require a physical prototype, at least when we're talking about the consumer electronics stuff. Are there any other forms of protection that you provide? Not really. I mean, you know, um, each, each project is its creators. It's their responsibility. You know, they're putting it out there and they're, they're bringing it to life in the way that they see fit. Um, and, you know, and what we see in the track record of the first four years has been phenomenal. I mean, people have done a, a really, really remarkable job uh, of bringing their projects to life. And so for us, you know, there, I mean, there are very basic checks that happen, things that any website would do, simple fraud, identity checks, things like that. Sure. But for the most part, you know, we're an open platform where people can share their idea and other people are, are deciding whether or not they, they think it's worth backing. Great. We've got a couple of minutes left. Let's take a couple of questions from, uh, from Twitter. We've got uh, Matthew Robert from Twitter. Are you planning to accept projects from Europe or Asia in the future, uh, or do you not want to expand that much for now? Very nice, Matthew. Very nice. <laughs> uh, well, we, we open up to, to projects in the UK for the first time in October. Um, people can back projects from anywhere, but to start a project right now, you have to be in the US or UK. Uh, we absolutely want to be available in more places around the world, um, but there's a lot of you know, red tape that goes with doing that, a lot of legal issues, especially the way uh, our, our system works. So it's a goal of ours and something that, that we will work towards. Um, yeah. Uh, from uh, FD Wang on Twitter, what was the most outrageous thing that you ever funded? Most outrageous thing that I ever funded? Well, I didn't fund the RoboCop, RoboCop statue, or else that would be it. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I like to back some ridiculous things. I don't know what I would cite offhand, though. I, I've backed, I think, 750 projects or so. So there's some, there's some weird ones Is in there. Is there one that stands out as your favorites over the years? Uh, well, there's a, you know, it's the early ones, the early ones that really stick with you, kind of like your, your firstborn. Um, there was a, a project in the, from the first few months by a woman named Emily Richmond um, who had a project where she was going to sail around the world by herself. And... Um, and one of her rewards was for $15, she would take a Polaroid at some point on her trip, and she would mail it to you from somewhere when she was in port. And um, so I backed that. That seemed romantic. And, uh, and you got your picture? Yeah. So about a year and a half later, I get a weird envelope in the mail, um, strange stamps on it. I open it up, and there's a, a map. And on one side of the map, there's a like, magic marker drawn around some spot in the South Pacific. On the other side is this letter describing to me sitting... Um, on this island and these monkeys and the beach and the trees around her wow. and tucked inside was, was this Polaroid. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I know you just backed up Veronica Mars. I saw that on Twitter as well. Uh, a question from Mars fan. Do you see more mainstream big name uh, films being uh, launched on, uh, on Kickstarter and does that in any way dilute the indiness of the brand? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't think it dilutes anything. I mean, the Veronica Mars thing is interesting. Um, it's, it's been a great week for people who like to have opinions on the internet. Um, <laughs> it's been a very good week. It's always a good week for that on the internet. Uh, but you know, with Veronica Mars, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a really exciting project because of, because of who Rob Thomas is and because of how much people love the show. And um, it's really kind of a perfect storm of a lot of great things. And, um, you know, we, we were excited to see how people would respond to that project. Um, and honestly, just along with everyone else, we're watching to see what's going to happen based on it. You know, it's... It, it's really, it's really hard to tell. Um, but, you know, Rob is a tremendous guy, and, and he's going he's gonna to create a great experience for his backers, for sure. All right. Yancy, thank you so much for helping us kick off the first ever Expand. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, hang around. We're going to have some 3D printers up on stage, which you will want to check out. So thanks again, Yancy. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Up to you, sir. Yeah.